Hello everyone, thanks for joining this session. I'm going to talk with you about Apache Beam uh, and how we use gRPC to make big data processing portable, portable between different execution systems and portable between different languages also. Uh, so first I introduce myself. My name is Ismail Mejia. I'm a software engineer and you can follow me on Twitter in this handle. I'm mostly working in Apache big data projects, basically Apache Abro and Apache PMC. I also contribute to others. And I'm a member of the Apache Server Foundation. I work for Talent, which is a big data and data integration company that has software, open source software and software in the cloud in case you want to take a look about. Okay, so first we're going to talk about the big data world. And this is a small introduction because I know the people who come to this conference mostly are into gRPC services, web, web service stuff, and this is a little bit different from a different use case than interesting too. So in the big data world, what we have is uh, basically we have big amounts of data that is distributed in different machines through a file, distributed file system or a distributed data store. And this, part, this we divide into partitions, and with these partitions we apply some functions, for example, with maps, or that we use to transform data from one format to the other. You can see this in the left side with the geometric figures. And also we have reduced functions that we use to, to group and aggregate data uh, and produce uh, results to analyze data, for example. Uh, this is for the batch case. The streaming case is quite similar. The di big difference is that we have continuous data that is arriving all the time. Uh, and But the operations are similar, but with a kind of constraint, and that is the fact that the data is still continuously arriving, and we have to decide at which point we want to calculate or aggregate the data. So this is when we stop and we aggregate. So this needs some extra functions to do this. And to do this kind of uh, programming, we have created many, many different frameworks in the last 15 years. And you probably know some of those, at least from name, like Hadoop. Uh, and most of these frameworks are Java-based because that's what we everybody started using at the time. So support for Java is quite mature in most of them, uh, but not for other languages. Mm. And we, we also, well, just, just for reference, what we basically do in big data is that you write your job, that is a set of steps of, uh, that transform the data. And these steps are coordinated through a coordinator mm -hmm. process and assigned to different workers that are going to, uh, to execute the task. And the tasks are, in the end, are user-defined functions that the, that the programmer put into into the system so in 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 the java case is is like that okay so what wha, um, so what happened when when what happened in the last years in the last 10 years is that uh the data science revolution appeared and we uh, people started to demand support for different languages like Python, for example, because they like their syntax, they like their expressiveness of the language, also because they can, they could reuse code that they already have, because they wanted to use the libraries and the ecosystems they, they have, like, uh, for example, Spytorch and all these kind of pandas libraries that people are familiar and pretty mature and good. And of course, also because of the communities, that's another, another reason to prefer some language uh, above the others. Uh, so, but this is something that we have to give importance. The importance that it has is that uh, the use of languages changes in time. And as you can see here in the last 15 years, that the, the, we can see the decline of Java versus the growing interest into Python. Of course, Java is still a huge language, but more people want to have more languages to be able to do their tasks, not only Python. So we enter Apache Beam. Apache Beam is a project, uh, it's an open source project uh, in the Apache Software Foundation. This was donated by Google. The idea is that we want to have a unified programming model, let's say like an SDK that we can use to create efficient and portable data processing pipelines. So the idea is that we use the Beam APIs with the, with the SDK, and we can run this in every system that we want, uh, every of these existing systems that are supported, of course. 
Uh, when we talk about unified model, the idea is that we want to support both batch and streaming computations with the same model. The idea is that we can have somehow some kind of deterministic streaming processing by assigning an event time to every element in, in the system. And with this, we can define when to aggregate the data. If we don't want to wait too much to aggregate the data, have results in advance, we can do it. Maybe with some trigger or maybe with defining a small, smaller windows in time. Again, just the, what we want here is to deal with the trade off of latency and correctness. So we cannot wait all the time to have correct results, but we can, we can adjust this. So this is what we mean with unified models. So basically we add some extra uh, semantics with, with transforms to the, to the system. And when we talk about portability, what we want is to be able to write our pipelines in our favorite language and then be able to translate those so they can be executed in the target system. Uh, in this case, for example, we want to run it in Spark or in Flink. Well, we're going to do this trans transformation with the runners. Uh, okay, so basically the B model works like this. We define a pipeline that is a collection of uh, that uses a collection of data that we're going to process in parallel. We call this collection P collection, and then we start to do transforms to these collections to produce new 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 collections and then output the, the data. It's a basic data flow model for those who are familiar with it. It's a simple graph of steps. Um, but each of these transforms that we have here are again parameterized by the user in, in, with their configuration of the transform, the, 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 the user defined function, let's say. Uh, so how, how does this, how are this working beam until recently, for example, from Java to Java translation, what we do is that users write their program in using the beam SDK. This is full Java. And then we, in Beam, we translate this. We, we translate from the Beam functions into the target functions. If you are familiar with the Spark, for example, we produce an RDD and we do RDD.map and we map the function. And, and all of this is quite straightforward because the functions are similar between the different systems because almost all of the, them have to support the basic same functions. And what we do is mostly wrapping and unwrapping and wrapping the, the functions there. Oops. Uh, okay, so that's okay for Java, but what happens when we have to support other languages? What happens with Python? One approach that we can take is just to see how JVM systems uh, are supported, support Python today, for example, with Spark. Spark, what it does is that if the user writes the program in Python, it invokes the, the Java part uh, using Py4j, and then the job is distributed and the worker is going to do the task. But instead of doing the task, it's going to instantiate the, the Java, uh, the, the, sorry, the Python process, and they're going to talk with through Unix pipes. This is how it works. This, of course, is, is a good solution. It, it solves the problem, but has some issues. And some, some of the issues is the issue of that, of passing the data from back and forth. And you can enter in some kind of double serialization, or at least you have to get data in and out of the JVM. Also, you have the, the, you lose the, the control of the resources because the Python memory is not inside of the JVM. So it's not going to respect the limits that you put in the JVM. So it can go out and this is a common problem. And more important, the dependencies cannot be ready in the cluster when you're running the job. So it is, it is, uh, it, it, they should be prepared or they won't be working. So this is another issue that is not solved by this approach. Uh, so Beam for, to tackle this created what we call the portability framework. And the portability framework is, uh, it's, well, the main goal is to tackle the problem of how to execute any language in every runner, in every existing system. Of course, we have some constraints. First, we, we have to support Java and Python because for historical reasons, that's what we have, we support now. Well, we support it from the beginning. Also, we have to provide an expected execution environment. So with the core dependencies, we expect that uh, to solve this problem, we we won't have a big overhead and the performance is going to be important also. And we are going to support also multiple language data representation. So, so but of course, finally, we, we want to have an easy to evolve system. Uh, 
So the gist of the, the, the of the idea is that instead of just using this uh, user defined function as we do can do with Java, what we're going to do is to delegate this execution to a companion container, it's kind of like a sidecar container that you can that we are going to control through services to pass data, pass the function, and be able to execute it in every task executed by the worker. So this is basically the big idea. Of course, there are more things. So this the, this full design includes three three big elements: the runner API, so called. This is basically an agnostic uh, representation of what a pipeline is, of this set of steps of transformation. Uh, the job API, that is a service to submit submit the uh, pipelines to be executed and to manage this execution. Uh, the FN API is a little bit more complex. It's the set of services that, that allows us to control the execution, to transfer the data. I'm going to see those in detail now. But first, why we chose gRPC? Well, gRPC first, it has an efficient serialization format, and this was important because we wanted to pass, uh, to, pass to have a well-defined messages and efficient. Of course, portable code buffers uh, has many of the things that we wanted. First, supports multiple languages, and and we can use it with Java and Python pretty easily. We have a consistent serialization format that was a, an historical problem we had because Java serialization is not deterministic. We, it was strongly typed, so we can have a more a, a, a representation that is more consistent in time. We're going to find errors more easily, not like with JSON. <coughs> Uh, we have a compact and efficient encoding and decoding, and we can evolve this like we do with Uh Also, well, we have the support of on backwards compatible support, also protocol buffers for major versions. That's good too. Uh, back to gRPC. Well, other thing of gRPC that is really nice is that we have a really simple service definition, so it's quite straightforward to define the services, and we gain the network performance advantages of gRPC. We get the, the multiplexing because of HTTP2, so in the, in the networking side, so this is pretty good. And really interesting for our use case is we have the rich communication models, we have subscriptions, we have bidirectional streaming, which can apply for different tasks, as we are going to see in, in our services. So the portability framework, this is the full image now. It's a little bit more complex than, than before, but I'm going to explain it in detail. Don't be overwhelmed by the image. It's quite straightforward once it's explained. So first we have now the, the users write their program, and instead of sending their code, we're going to transform all of this into a protocol buffers object that is going to be the input of the execution. So this is going to be produced from Python or from Java in the same kind of object and, and then sent to the to the job server to be executed. The jobs the, the, this definition is if you remember the 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 small piece of code that I showed before, well it's almost the same ideas. We have the transform, we have the collection, we have some internal details like win, how they are windowed, and we, we send this. The, the job server and the job service uh, allows us to control the execution of, of a job, of a pipeline. Uh, and if you see, this is just a submission and management protocol. We, Even if you are not familiar with gRPC, this is the first time you are seeing gRPC, I think you can immediately understand this. I mean, like, we define a service that has this kind of um, methods. Uh, and well, we can we can prepare an execution. We can get the state, the current state of the job we want to run, and we can cancel an, a running job. But more important uh, for the for the to prove the semantics of gRPC is that we can also be interested in subscribing to some changes in this job. And this is common. For example, I, I can I can be interested to know to have an alert or have a, or react to the, when when a message is finished. So we can do this. There is this subscription, and then. The, then also, well, you can be interested in other kind of messages. Uh, now uh, we have also the, um, the the final set of services is the um, FN API we call those, and this FN API uh, allows us to invoke the function inside of the container and to control this execution. 
But to do this, we need different things. First, we need to have the right artifacts as part of the container. And this is what the artifact services do. And this is basically to get the dependencies. Um, and uh, OK, so this is, this is what the artifact ser service does. And then once we have the dependencies, what well, we can see the service, sorry. Uh, what we what you can see is we can put artifacts to store them, and we can commit a manifest to say they're, they're, they're pass the hash and uh, 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 and the permissions they have. Of course, we can retrieve these artifacts and use them. That's what the what the container does. And this container that is we call harness uh, uh, is is doing. Then we have to instantiate the harness, the container, and to do this, we have this provision API. The provision API allows us to define a set of uh, resources, let's say, like we can define memory for this container, limits, we can CPU limits also. So this is this is what it does. Once we have the dependencies and the container is instantiated, then it comes the services to pass the data and the functions. So we have uh, the data plane services that basically allows us to pass data straight to the to the system. We have below the state API that is mostly for caching data in the in the different workers uh, and the data apis as you can see here is quite straightforward it's just bytes i mean it's bidirectional streams of bytes that with other tied to to other instructions that are going to be using this data uh, is a logical stream of data that contains the elements and <coughs> and for the case of protobuf we we well in protobuf we have this limitation of the uh, oh sorry in, in protocol buffers we have this difference between between languages uh, some languages support a maximum size of two gigabytes others a maximum size of four gigabytes well in the case of Beam, we assume the lowest common um, size size that is two gigabytes for this uh, Okay, so now the control APIs. The control APIs allows us to basically control the execution. So we send a graph with the specific user-defined functions. We stream the elements and we get the, 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 the elements out. Uh, how is this done? This is done uh, with this uh, definition. Again, we have a bidirectional stream. Uh, we just send requests and responses. Uh, and the common requests here are... Uh, the common request here is, is uh, to process a bundle. A bundle is a subset of data uh, that is going to be tied to a function. Also, well, of course, we have, we can request to have progress of the execution. And on, another common instruction is to split the execution. And when this happens, this happens when we want to divide the execution and pass uh, the, the missing part to a different task or a different, in the, maybe in a different work. This is this allows to, us to have more parallelism. How this works? Well, this is a simple diagram. But basically, we register the functions, then we request the SDK to process the function. We prepare the functions. Once we initialize the functions, we start to stream the input elements. We process the elements. Then we signal this is the end, and then we get the outputs. This is basically how it works. Uh, finally, we have a uh, last uh, service that is the login service. Again, a bidirectional uh, streaming service. Why bidirectional? Because we have we want to have the results also as fast as we can of log. Uh, we have to have the information. If you are familiar with any login system like uh, Log4j, well, you can see this the, the different levels you have and the, the timestamp of when things happen and the message. Uh, this is pretty straightforward also. Okay, <coughs> so this is the um, this is uh, the world set of services. This is how we re-implemented Beam to support multiple language execution. And now we're going to talk about the present. So some of the things that we get with the portability framework was isolation of user code. Now we can reproduce exactly the environment that the user wants to execute their job. Uh, which is super important. And this gives us a blueprint also for new languages, to support new languages. Now, if we want to support a new language, we know exactly what you have to do. You have to implement these this services, of course, the, 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 all the URPC services, and you have to implement an API. 
for the language and the, the integration is immediate with all the different systems. So we don't have to retranslate into f f Java or into Flink, sorry, into Spark. No, now if this is supported, it will be supported. So we just have to work in the language part. Uh, of course, in the present, we have now an implementation, full implementation for different open source systems like Flink, Apache Flink, and Apache Spark. And uh, the Google Data Flow Runner now supports this. It's experimental. This is not open source, but the users of Data Flow in the cloud can use it. And the Samsung Runner also is a work in progress. So this is getting more mature now. Uh, we have this thing we call the the capability matrix that shows how much of the B model is supported by by the different systems that we translate into uh, via the runners. So for Flink we have full support. For Spark we have uh, only support for batch, but work on streaming is coming. We also are now testing all of this uh, through what we call the validus runner suite. The validus runner suite is a set of um, is a set of, uh, let's say, like a TCK to validate the completeness of the model. So this is corner cases for every kind of transform and use case. We run this for every PR that is done into Beam, and now we have all of this passing for the classic translation we did from Java to Java, but also for this new translation with all the gRPC services. Uh, thanks to that, now we have support for Golang, that is the most recent uh, uh, language that we support now on Beam, and Go is the first language that is pure uh, portable. So Go from the beginning translates into protocol buffers and uses all these services. Of course, Go is still a work in progress, but this is pretty nice that we can now run, for example, Go pipelines with a Spark, uh, with uh, thanks to Beam. And um, finally, well, what is coming now is just working into performance tests to catch regressions and try to make things even faster. Okay, so we had nice outcomes of this work. First one was that since now we can support uh, Python live, live running in different open source systems, well, projects that use Beam Python API now can be used also in the open source side. And in particular, TFX, that is uh, this TensorFlow project uh, to deploy production, to deploy ML and machine learning pipelines. Uh, now it can be used uh, in the open source runners without any modifications, so they can use all these data validation functions, data preprocessing, everything is, is works out of the box. Also, another interesting outcome is that this new architecture allows us to have cross-language pipelines, which means that we can have pipelines that have steps in different languages. For example, you can, you, I mean, you can wonder how, when, it's interesting to support different languages. One case can be when you don't have an available connector, for example, to a data store in your language, but it's in the different language. So you can use the Java API from Python, for example, just to get the data in. Or the opposite, once you want to use one of the libraries, for example, an inference um, function from TensorFlow from Java, what well, you can do now through the Python APIs. So this is a um, mix and match, but uh, really useful. Another nice outcome we have is performance. And this, I have to confess that I was kind of negative when all this architecture was proposed because, I mean, I, I, I expected a big overhead. But the, the interesting results that are in this graph that my colleague Alexei shared is that uh, uh, with, once you have more data, the overhead of this gRPC communication and services doesn't matter that much. And this is really nice because it proves that uh, for our use case that it's mostly big data, uh, it's, it's a good solution. Uh, finally, also, uh, another another really nice outcome is that this, uh, let's say, architectural reference of using this sidecar container control with the, with the gRPC services is a good base because now Apache Flink is starting to use it uh, to use the to execute Python code since the last version. Uh, and also they have a project called the Stateful Functions that is really interesting in case you want to take a look at this. The idea here is to have Lambda-like functions, Lambda in the serverless sense. And one alternative in stateful functions is that you can collocate functions in different languages, and this will be executed with 
it's the, the same approach with this kind of services that pass data, pass the function, and then running the DLP. So it's a pretty neat um, result to see that other, other projects saw what we were doing and found that this is a good idea to solve their problems. Uh, finally, well, and more related to this conference, well, using gRPC was pretty nice to detect uh, the changes and, and uh, well, first, because we had, we. Well, first to detect the changes and add new features, for example, we, we have uh, things that we didn't conceive correctly from the beginning, like the addition of environments. That means that people, some people don't want to execute, for example, Docker, but run in the side projects, in the, the side processes. So we can do this with environments. We can also support new features that were not in the Beam model before, like timer families. All of this has been added into the into our messages contracts and our, our, our services. It's been pretty good. Of course, having a rich communication model uh, to adapt to the different use cases has been pretty useful also for Beam. And of course, all the backwards compatibility and, and now soon versioning that we will have uh, has been some robust things of gRPC. Uh, the pain points that we have, because well, not everything is perfect, is that we had to vendor gRPC, but this is so a, a common problem in Java because gRPC and protocol buffers leaks from others of uh, our systems APIs. Not, 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 for example, our dependencies. Some of those end up leaking protobuf, and we had a mess with this leak protobuf. So we vendor gRPC, but uh, but we keep uh, up to date with the latest versions as much as we can. What is the future of this? Well, uh, we are working now on stabiliz the stabilization of all these APIs, uh, the, the services and messages, uh, just to give uh, backwards compatibility and guarantees to other projects that may use it. Uh, we have also, well, we, we plan now to have better ergonomics that running all of this together is more easy for the end users and have better documentation for this also. We, of course, will plan to continue the work in performance analysis and improve improve also some maybe rough areas that are still there. And we want to have deployments, how to, so you can run this um, kind of architecture with the different services, depending on your use case in Kubernetes or in Hadoop or, or in EMR, but with just a Spark, the different, different uses. If you are more interested and you want to contribute to this, well, you can try to try. The first thing you can do is try it, see how it works. If you want to go into the gRPC part, well, you go ahead. We will be happy to help you and, and give you feedback or receive, of course, your ideas. And if you have future requests, if you want to add more observability capabilities to this, because we don't have many, you can do. Uh, and of course, if you are interested in working .NET and gRPC and you want to bring .NET to, to us, it would be super great to work with you. Uh, but, but more important, you, any collaboration would be acceptable using it and seeing and, and using Beam also, if you are not just into the gRPC part, but also want to use the big data parts, it would be perfect. We are very interested in having you. If you want to go deeper into this design, want to learn more about Beam, I like these links that you can get with the slides. Um, finally, I just wanted to invite you to the BIM Summit that is happening at the end of August of this year. It's going to be free and online, so you can register now and, and assist. Uh, definitely, there will be more presentations that go deeper than I went into the into the um, uh, portability framework. And of course, all the world of BIM. Okay, that's all for me. Thanks. Uh, if you have questions.